Okay, well, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see all right anyway. So the purpose of this is really that, as you all know, this is going to be sort of the year of WASC, whether we like it or not. And uh, it did occur to me, and talking to a few people, it was confirmed that um, for many people around the university, this is kind of like jumping in the middle of a conversation, that everybody sort of knows about WASC and accreditation, but maybe it would help to sort of roll back and talk a little bit about what the whole process is about, where it comes from, what's at stake, you know, how the thing rolls out, just so that everybody sort of has a common familiarity of it. So that's the purpose of the presentation. Uh, for many of you, this may be old news, but uh, maybe I'll be able to give you a little bit of new information and start to help you look forward to the visit that we're going to encounter later in the year. So that's the point. Now, I was in Los Angeles and in Irvine giving this presentation yesterday, and in LA in particular, I got teased rather badly because there are a whole bunch of images in this presentation, and all of them, they said, dated me. So, does anybody not know what this pre picture is of? I think, I think this was about Woody Allen dating. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Who doesn't recognize this image? See, a few people, but not younger than me. Not <laughs> well, there's a, a, a fine old Woody Allen movie called Everything You've Always Wanted to Know About Sex, but we're afraid to ask. Now you get the joke, right? <laughs> it's where I learned everything I know. Okay. Um, here we go. And a f pretty slick, huh? So I'm going to do this in kind of four chapters. Uh, one, I want to talk a little bit about the accreditation, what I call the accreditation machine, you know, how this thing is structured, and what this organization WASC is all about, and its re uh, relatives in the accreditation world. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the standards, the visit that we're going to have later in the year, and then talk a little bit about what everybody's role is. So let's start off. I was thinking, of, I came up with this notion of the accreditation machine. One of the things about many things about higher education in the United States that is absolutely unique in the world is the way we go about accrediting and qualifying colleges and universities. Um, it is a crazy process, as I will soon demonstrate, uh, that nobody would have ever designed intentionally, but it is what it is and we have to live with it. And in looking for an image, uh, as you can tell I love Google Images, that would sort of display what I think about the accreditation machine, this is the best one I could come up with. Um, also dating me, by the way, if you've never heard of Rube Goldberg, you are a child. Um, but there were all these cartoons, I think in the, what, 50s? Uh, these crazy elaborate machines that he would design to do for fairly simple things. So this guy is putting toothpaste on his toothbrush in a fairly elaborate way. This is a little bit like what accreditation looks like uh, in the U.S. Turns out there are all kinds of accreditors and accrediting bodies and agencies that have a role in determining um, the, both the quality and the qualifications of higher education in our country. We're going to talk mostly about the regional accreditors, and in particular our own regional accreditor, which is the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. But there are a bunch of other players in the field. So there are a group of what are called national accreditors. I'm actually not going to spend any time on these, but these look a lot like regional accreditors, except they're not. Uh, leave it at that for the moment. Um, there are specialized accreditors, and, and many of you here are very familiar with APA, the MFT accreditors, COAMF, the AACSB, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit about those. There are state boards that have jurisdiction over some programs, uh, and a couple of these apply to us, and so I'll talk about those. And then there are state higher education authorities, which uh, have a more overarching uh, uh, jurisdiction. So to begin to show how this all fits together, Let's imagine you were going to create a university from scratch and you wanted to think about what kinds of approvals and authorities you were going to need to make this work. So let's give it a name first of all. Um, and let's imagine that you were going to figure out what kind of programs you want. So you're going to have an undergraduate program, this is going to drive me nuts, uh, psychology, business, education, forensics, oh, let's throw in a law program too. Now, not that anybody would ever build a university like this. This would be absolutely nuts, of course. Um, but if you were going to have a university that had these set of programs in it, um, where would you go to sort of get legitimized and 
get the authority for doing all of this stuff. Well, the first thing you would do is go to um, the state. And every state has some sort of a body that actually uh, licenses colleges and universities to be colleges and universities. That's why you get to call yourself a university, because you got a state license. If any of you have ever been to our commencements, you know that the very last words of the commencements that I get to stand up and say are, by the power of the state of, uh, vested in me by the state of California, I now confer on you thus and so degrees. Well, this is where that happens. Uh, there, there really is a power conferred by the state of California. I always have a feeling I should say you may now kiss the bride when I'm done with that, but um, so far I've resisted. But anyway, the, the state uh, uh, gives a charter to an institution that is covers the entire institution. It's not about a particular program. It is that you're either a university or you're not. It's one of those on and off kinds of things. Uh, and in the state of California, there's something called the California Post-Secondary Education Commission, CPEC, uh, which is the arbiter of this kind of thing. The next thing you'd probably want to do is go and get yourself accredited. And this is what we're going to wind up talking about. And I want to make one point at this stage, which is that like this state licensure, regional accreditation also covers the whole institution. Either the whole thing is accredited or it isn't. And so it's uh, during the process, as you will see, this is a case where we put the whole institution up for inspection. Um, and it's not a matter that one piece can be accredited and the others can't. That's where all the other players come in. So this is one we're all in this room, most of us, pretty familiar with. So if you wanted to have a first class psychology program, the sort of gold standard of accreditation in psychology, as we all know, is the APA, the American Psychological Association, which accredits some, but actually not all, psychology uh, forms of psychology programs, right? It does clinical doctorate programs, but it doesn't do some other, other things. Um, and you actually don't have to have it, right? There are a lot of unaccredited, by which we mean non-APA accredited, psychology schools. Um, it varies from state to state what that means. In some states, you can't actually sit for licensure unless you come out of an APA accredited school. In other states, it doesn't matter. Um, California is uh, uh, an open state in that regard, and we've got there are, uh, fewer and fewer of these, but as recently as 10 years ago, uh, there were a whole bunch of unaccredited uh, psychology schools, even right here in the Bay Area. Um, let's say you're in the education business. Again, in the state of California, uh, the sort of fundamental thing you got to do is get yourself approved by something called the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing. CCTC, which our school is. This is what allows its, our graduates to be licensed as teachers in the state of California. And without that, we really wouldn't have an education school. Some education schools, but not all, also have their own version of a kind of APA gold standard, which is called the National something of accreditation. I forgot, with National Council of Accrediting Teachers of Education or something like that, NCATE. Um, and um, it is like the APA. It's, it's a kind of uh, professionally oriented uh, uh, sign of approval. And in some states, again, that matters more than in others. In some states, if you've come out of an NK accredited program, uh, there's more reciprocity of your license across state lines and so forth. But it's not necessarily the case, and it isn't the case in California. Uh, business schools have uh, accreditors also. The most uh, familiar, the biggest one, is called the American Association of Collegiate Schools of Business, AACSB. There are others um, that apply to business schools. Now, business is a little bit different because unlike, say, psychology and teaching, there is actually no licensure involved, right? So to be a manager in a company, you don't need to be licensed. Um, so a lot of business schools are... Uh, a little less concern. This has a lot more to do with marketing and rankings and stuff like that than it does with uh, an official ticket to be able to send your graduates to practice their professions. But nonetheless, it's a very prestigious thing. Only about half of the business schools in the United States have AACSB accreditation. Um, so, and the reason is because the standards require such a high level of resources that it's extremely expensive uh, to be an accredited school. There are some other accreditors whose standards are a little different. We're actually beginning to look at one of them uh, for our program, but it'll be a couple of years before we get there. 
What else do we have? Oh, law. So our law school, uh, San Francisco Law School, is recognized by something called the Committee of Bar Examiners by the state of California. So a little bit, again, like CCTC. Uh, it is a state uh, authorizing agency which allows the graduates of the San Francisco Law School to sit for the bar exam. Now, Jane Gamp can tell you it's even a little screwier because you can be at an unaccredited law school and still, you're right, take an extra test or two and you can get accredited. Uh, you can, you can uh, actually become uh, a member of the bar in California. The other thing that's different about California is that we're the only state or one of the few states that uh, has a state uh, bar examiner, one of a few, right? So anyway, there are other things about California that are, are uh, a little weird. But like other schools, there's also um, a professional association, in this case the American Bar Association, which accredits law schools. And, um, you know, like others, it's kind of the gold standards. It's what separates some of the really uh, premier law schools from others, at least in terms of reputation and so forth. Um, uh, San Francisco Law School has survived just fine for 100 years without that. And uh, probably like the business school, uh, given the kind of clientele we have, the kind of business we're in, the law business, we probably, it's going to be a long time, if ever, if we could afford to be ABA accredited, because again, there were, the resource requirements are so extraordinarily heavy that it's, it's a, a very, very tough thing to do. So anyway, you begin to see how complicated all of this is. And you notice also that things like undergraduate uh, don't have any specialized accreditation at all. So even though the vast majority of students in higher education are studying at the undergraduate level, there is no specialized accreditor for them. And some programs, in our case like forensics, also at the moment at least don't have any specialized accreditor available to them. So even if you want to get it, it's not there. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the regional accrediting picture. Um, and I'll just go to the next slide because it's easier. And in our case, of course, that means, the, as I said, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, WASC, which is the name of our regional accreditor. A little bit of history. Um, back, I think, I don't have the exact date, but I would say in the early 50s, there was no such thing as this kind of accreditation. Um, the reason it came about was because of all of the student uh, or uh, federal student financial aid programs that were being developed. After World War II, we had the GI Bill, we had the National Defense Student Loan Act, which morphed into the current guaranteed student loan programs. The government started putting lots and lots and lots of money into the hands of students to go to college. Notice they didn't put the money in the hands of the colleges, they put it in the hands of the students. And what they wanted then was a way to say, you can take your money to any college you want to, but we want to make sure it's a legitimate place, right? And they needed a way to do this. And there wasn't any way. Uh, because prior to this, you could call yourself a university, and it really didn't have, you know, there was no, no regulation attached to it. Now, in this country, um, there has always been a huge resistance to uh, the idea of a centralized ministry of education, which is what absolutely every other country on the planet has. We don't, right? Um, and so the government, there wasn't even a U.S. Department of Education at the time, but the Fed said, okay, we need some way to figure out which schools are legitimate, which aren't, so that students can know where to take their money that we're handing them. And so they said to, they went out and they looked around and they, they found that there were a bunch of regional membership organizations in the country, and they invited them to take on the role of being the gatekeepers for these student loan programs. And that's how this evolved. So it turned out there was something called the Western College Association, um, which was sitting around, you know, just having meetings for the sake of meetings, the way we all do. Um, and the government kind of said, well, do you want to do something real and important? <laughs> and they said, okay. So they took on the role in this particular region of being the gatekeeper for this. Now they, uh, WASC in this case, uh, have to go through their own accreditation process. And they go periodically to something called the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity. There's a mouthful. Um, and they have to kind of get recertified every few years uh, to play this role on behalf of the government. So even, they're not, even though they're not a government agency, they are given this mandate by the government. Okay? This is more than you want to know, but trust me, it'll, be, it'll get interesting. 
The last point I want to make about this is that because these things are associations and because higher education in our country is so diversified, the associations themselves are made up of all kinds of organizations, right? So we got the big guys like Berkeley and UCLA, big public institutions. We got big private universities like USC and Stanford. We got little private universities like Mills College and Alliant International University and, you know, Southern California is just chock full of little religious colleges, you know, with 200 students in them. They're members of WASC as well. And then you've got, recently, more and more, the big for-profits coming in. So members of the WASC association include places like Argosy and the University of Phoenix and so forth, right? So it is an incredibly diverse group of institutions that are all covered. And I'll, this is going to be important later. I want to come back and talk about why accreditation works the way it does. This is the key of In theory, this is a voluntary membership association. We don't really have to be a part of WASC. But again, if you want access to those student loans, you got to get accredited, and this is the only game in town. So um, it's only in theory that it's voluntary. OK, last thing about regional accreditation. Um, this is a map that shows you the regions. There are six of them. And you see that the biggest one is called the North Cent. They call themselves the Higher Education Commission, but it's the North Central Region. Basically runs from the Appalachians to the Rockies, and it's enormous. Um, southeast, Middle States, the New England Association, the uh, Northwest Association, and here's little old Wask, which is all of California and Hawaii and like Guam. Um, <laughs> Uh, we are by far the smallest region geographically and actually numerically as well. There are about 150 colleges and universities in the Wasp region. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny area. Now, because, uh, again, we don't have any centralized national standards for this, there's actually, there are different standards in different parts of the country. Each region gets to set its own rules about what accreditation consists of, and they, are, they do differ. So the North Central region, at least historically, this is changing now, but historically it was always known as sort of the, the easy one to get accredited. In. And, you know, notice how big it is. It uh, tells you something. Um, uh, something you may not be aware of is that the reason, say, the University of Phoenix is the University of Phoenix and not the University of San Jose, where they started, is because they couldn't get accredited by WASC. And so John Sperling moved the whole thing to Arizona so he could be in the North Central region and he got accredited. So they have been seen as the kind of loose uh, players in it. Uh, Southeast has always been known as a kind of by the book, check off the list and you're in or you're out. And there's very rigid, no nonsense kind of stuff. Uh, you know, New England's got all of these fancy uh, Ivy League schools in it, so it's very collegial different approach to it. WASC, you know, has the same reputation that the rest of California does as far as the rest of the country is concerned. You know, always on the cutting edge and slightly flaky. Um, you know, uh, trying to be different. Uh, you know, thinking of itself as a kind of trendsetter, but always, you know, kind of weird. Um, and uh, that's definitely its reputation. Okay, so anyway, sum up. Regional accreditors play two very distinct roles in this whole machinery that's kind of crazy. First of all, again, they accredit the entire institution, not specific programs. And secondly, they're the gatekeepers for the federal financial aid. That's why we are dealing with it. Okay, I'm going to move on. Any questions? Okay. The standards. All right. Anybody not recognize this one? All right, somebody say who it is. Charlton Heston is Moses. <laughs> Same difference. There you go, that's it. Mary gets it. Thank you, Mary. Okay, what do we got here? I forgot what the next image is. Okay. So we, the thing that guides the whole accreditation process is something called the Standards of Accreditation, and they're contained in something called the WASC Accreditation Handbook. For those of you who are really desperate you know, for something to do, you can go online and find this under WASC. Um, 
they are, this is the kind of rules of the road of accreditation. And the um, key thing, and this goes back to my point about the variety of institutions, uh, the real challenge in developing this is how do you develop rules of the road that cover this kind of incredible array of institutions? How do you develop rules of the road that cover everything from you know, USC and Berkeley to us, or again, one of those little Bible colleges in Orange County? Um, it is a really, really big challenge to sort of come up with anything common about that. And again, this is something that's kind of weird about our country. I think it's a good thing in this case, but it is kind of weird that, you know, if you get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a doctoral degree, it doesn't actually mean the same thing across institutions. Um, yeah, we don't really have very clearly defined standards of what it means to, say, have a bachelor's degree in this country. It kind of means whatever got approved by this process that we described. In the last decade, there has been a huge shift in the accreditation world away from an older kind of approach, which really was focused on resources and inputs. You know, how many books were in your library and how many faculty noses could they count? And, you know, what were your classrooms like? And did you have enough chalk for the blackboards? I mean, that was literally the, the level of the accreditation reviews until about 10 or 15 years ago. And then there started to be a real increased focus on outcomes and assessment. This very much mirrors what's been happening in the K-12 area. You've all, you're all aware of No Child Left Behind, this kind of huge national movement toward assessment, trying to figure out how we know whether we're succeeding in education. The, the version of that that has played out at the higher education level has been through the uh, way that the federal government has influenced the accreditation standards of the six regional accreditors. They're very indirect, not nearly as kind of... Uh, on, on point as what's happened in the K-12, but it's the same motivation. Um, and as a result of that, a lot of increased demand for evidence, data. You know, don't just tell me you're doing a good job, prove it. Um, and again, not so much on resources, but about processes and, and, and ways of doing business that we have to describe. Uh, I don't want to know that you got chalk in your chalk trees. I want to know what you're doing with it. Okay. Well, I'm not going to read all, a bunch of slides with a lot of words on it, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I wanted to give you a very quick view of what the standards kind of look like. There are four of them in the WASC handbook. I was actually a WASC commissioner uh, at the time that this handbook was uh, being developed, and, and uh, I uh, played a role in developing it. There used to be something like, I don't know, 20 standards, and we boiled them down to four. I uh, thought that was an improvement. I'm not fully sure it was. But um, it was a, a well-met attempt. Standard one, the big overarching uh, kind of category is called defining institutional purposes and ensuring in educational objectives. And there's a lot of talk in the handbook about this notion, a lot of talk at the commission level about institutional purposes. And really what this is all about is to require an institution to be able to articulate what it is trying to do. And again, given the diversity and the range of institutions we've got in this country, that's not an insignificant thing, right? How do you know what Alliant is trying to do as opposed to what Mills College is trying to do as opposed to what USC is trying to do if the institution isn't able to say so clearly? Now, those of you who've been around for the last five or six years know that we've put an awful lot of emphasis on you know, defining our mission and thinking about the kind of purpose of this institution and how we take all of our various moving parts and make them look like they belong to something. And a lot of it is because of this. It's not solely because WASP requires us to do it, but it is absolutely critical that we be able to say, this is the kind of institution we claim to be, right? Um, because that's the starting point for everything that follows. And, and I think we've done a good job of this, but it, it, this is what's motivating Big section on integrity. You'd be surprised at the number of institutions that fail on this count, but it's kind of simple stuff. You know, do you have your own rules and regulations clearly published so the students know what they're buying? Um, are you honest with the public about your programs and, and descriptions of them? Are you honest with WASC about what's going on? Um, you know, do you have a, a good track record in, in terms of your business relationships with everybody? 
So it's a fairly commonsensical standard, but it actually is a, a tough one. Notice that academic freedom is actually one of the standards of integrity uh, that is required of all institutions. Standard two, achieving educational objectives through core functions. Um, two big categories again. One is, you know, how are we supporting scholarship and creative activity? So, uh, it, again, it's not enough to uh, just say, well, we're churning out students by teaching classes. Uh, WASC expects that an institution of higher education has a meaningful and significant commitment to scholarship because that is part of what it means to be a part of higher education in this country. Um, and so, you know, do we have ways of rewarding it and, and actively promoting it among uh, faculty and students? And do we provide adequate support for student learning and success? Do we have all the right uh, stuff that's going on outside the classroom? Do we have counseling? Do we have uh, student support services and um, uh, what is information for transfer students? Do we have this is a key one: equitable treatment for students with respect to academic policies. Now, I'm going to make this point a few times, so forgive me. But one of the things I've been harping on the last couple of years is this notion of equitable treatment for students with regard to our policies. The challenge for us at Alliant is having equitable treatment across all of our programs and campuses. Because of our history, we've got a lot of different practices around our system. And, um, you know, they're all fine in their own right, but when you look at the treatment that a student might get in Fresno versus what they might get in Irvine versus what they might get in Mexico City, you could argue that they need to be the same if they're really equitable, right? And remember, again, I'll come back to this again, WASC is interested in us as a single entirety, not as a bunch of different parts. So equity in this case means the whole thing, the whole institution. So this is why we've really got to worry and have done, and I think we're making good progress on sort of cleaning up and standardizing our processes across the system. Standard three, developing and applying resources and structures to ensure sustainability. You know, a lot of fancy language. What it boils down to is, um, do we have uh, sufficient uh, faculty, sufficient staff with the appropriate qualifications uh, in place to guarantee that we can deliver the educational product that we promise? Now, again, there's a lot of kind of loose language about this. It says, do you have enough faculty? Do you have enough staff? Well, how much is enough? Well, the only way you define that is against what you're trying to accomplish, right? It's not like it says you got to have 50 faculty. It says you need enough. So everything, again, comes back to the starting point that we declare, you know, this is sufficient for training people in clinical psychology or in education or in management or whatever, and here's how we know it's enough. Because it's not just a matter of saying, we think this is the right number. Remember the demand for data? we got to be able to say, and here's how we know this is the right number. That's the challenge we face. Uh, same standard, more about resources. Do you have enough other stuff? And this is where they get back to, do you have enough chalk in the rooms, and do you have enough computers, and do you have enough rooms, and do you have enough money? Now, again, there's no absolute standard. It doesn't say you have to have an endowment of $20 million to be in business. It says, do you have enough money? Well, okay, how do we know that? Um, and so we have a, 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 a requirement that we be able to show that we have a sustainable financial model that can move forward. Organizational structures and decision making. Do we have the right things in place to make good, clear, cogent decisions? Do we have communication processes? Uh, do we have, there are a few things that are absolutely required. There has to be a full-time chief executive officer. You can't have a part-time president. Um, you can't have a part-time chief financial officer because there's a sense that somebody has got to be home mind in the store every day, even if everybody else is kind of far flung. Um, uh, do we have effective faculty academic leadership over various uh, uh, programs to ensure both the academic quality and the maintenance of our educational purposes and character? So faculty governance is important. Um, one another thing we've worked hard on over the last five years is to build up a sense of system-wide faculty governance through the faculty senate that frankly didn't exist before. And it's been 
very critical that we be able to show that we've got that in place, where they're actually dealing with with real substantive issues and having an effect on their own. Uh, standard four, are we committed to learning and improvement? One of the things that WASC um, in this new handbook set as a goal was to say essentially doesn't matter how good you are today we want to know that you're trying to get better so it doesn't really matter that Stanford depending on which ranking you want to look at is either the second best university in the world or the fifth best university in the world uh, even they have to prove that they're got, have processes in place in which they're in a continuous improvement cycle and so obviously if it applies to them it applies to the rest of us so here's another way in which it's not so much that there's a hard and fast uh, bar that you have to hit. It is that we have to demonstrate that we're serious about the idea of constantly trying to make the place better. And again, this comes back to a notion that everything has got to be resting on data and information. Now, how do we know where we are today? How do we know what we're trying to accomplish? And how do we know we're achieving those goals? So data becomes really, really important. Uh, did I get them all? Strategic thinking and planning. WASC uh, uh, is very big on this sense of directionality with an institution. You know, do you have a sense that you know where the place is going? Uh, and again, how do you know that? Is there a buy-in through the community around those goals? Uh, do you have a sense that everybody's kind of pulling on the oars in the same direction? Uh, okay, enough on that, I think. Okay. Come on. <laughs> All right, before I go to the visit, anything on the standards? Questions? Okay. Well, the way WASP does its business is through, again, a fairly complicated uh, set of processes, but they all come down to a visit. Again, with the new handbook in 2000, WASP uh, uh, broke the visit up into two separate pieces. And I am, frankly, between us, pretty critical of this, but it is what it is, and we're going to have to live with it for a while until we manage to get it changed. But what they've done is, is that uh, as a cycle begins, you go through a stage one visit, which is called the capacity and preparatory review visit, um, and then secondly, an educational effectiveness review. Remember, we had this last a year ago, March, right? Uh, so we were done with that piece. I'll talk about that in a minute. And what's going to happen this next March is it will go through the educational effectiveness review. Um, both of these things happen sort of against uh, a set of goals that we help define. So again, to make the point, you got to start with what kind of institution you are, and then you got to talk about what you're trying to do. Both of these involve both kind of self-definition and a self-statement about your goals and priorities. And that's the good thing, because it means that the, the, the whole premise of the visit is that it is about us on our own terms, not necessarily taking standards from one institution and trying to apply them to us. So that's a good thing about the process. It means that there's an awful lot of work to do in going through that development of the, you actually submit a proposal to say we're kind of, we're willing to be tested on the following subjects, kind of, right? And, uh, and WASC either accepts that or they say, nah, that's too easy. Uh, you, you can't get by that easily. And so we put forward a, a pretty ambitious proposal, actually. Um, the basic context of which was, you know, we've talked a lot about this idea about being a professional practice university. So what the heck does that mean? And how do we know we're defining it? And how do we know we're getting better at it? We submit a, uh, for each of these visits, there's a pretty lengthy report that's developed. The one that we submitted to for the capacity review was called uh, Professional Practice University in a Multicultural and International Context. If you haven't read it, I really do advise you to go take a look at this. It's on the portal. Um, it, uh, Patty Mullen, whom I'm sorry isn't here today, um, uh, Patty and, and Rodney Lohman and, and a few others really were the lead authors of it. It is really a spectacular document um, because I think it does a really good job of all the things I've been talking about. It's sort of defining who we aspire to be and the progress we're making.
toward getting there. So it's something you all ought to be familiar with. When the team comes, they're folks just like us. Um, the whole premise is that this is a peer review. Uh, the visitors are volunteers. Uh, they come from other colleges and universities. Uh, the chair of our team, uh, you basically get mostly the same team through both stages of the process. Uh, the chair of our team is the president of the University of Laverne, a guy named Steve Morgan, he's a very good fellow. Uh, and they typically will bring people who have some familiarity both with the kind of institution they're studying and also the disciplines that are most prominent. So we will undoubtedly have somebody from another professional psychology school, an education person, a business person, or whatever. So there are people who are familiar with uh, generally what we do. Um, and their role is to write a report that gets sent back to the commission, which is a group of about 30 people, also folks just like us, uh, which makes a decision about the reaccreditation. And that'll happen. Sure. We had our capacity review. It was in March of 2009. Um, uh, it was centered up here. Uh, they visited all three of the Northern California sites. The report was good. Uh, they loved our iMerit uh, work. Uh, and I think rightly recognized that as something that we're doing that is really pretty cutting edge. This notion of linking international internationalism with multiculturalism in a way that is uh, intellectually very, very interesting and unique. Uh, we got high marks for strategic planning and for uh, a surprisingly high degree of cohesion around our mission for our financial stability. The recommendations included uh, doing a better job of involving our adjunct faculty in the life of the university. I'd say we have made small progress in that. We actually need to do more on it. Um, and they were, quite honestly, a little skeptical that we're going to have the assessment uh, processes in place that we need for the next visit in March. Um, so we'll get a, our challenges to prove that they're wrong. But they didn't see much evidence of it a year ago. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, they've also, uh, the, the director of WASC was out in Hong Kong for other purposes, and so he visited our program there. And when the Tokyo students were here in San Francisco just uh, a couple of weeks ago, they did a little kind of mini site visit, and they got to interview the students. So they covered those bases. Um, so the educational effectiveness review will be the week of March 21, 2011. Uh, since they didn't hit the Southern California sites, uh, they're going to start there. This next time around, they'll base themselves in San Diego and probably visit Irvine and L.A. and probably Mexico City. We're still working that out. Uh, but uh, So I don't know that we'll actually have visitors up here, although they could. Because one of the things about this visit and one of my criticisms of this two-stage process is that although there was supposed to be a real separation of focus between the first one and the second one, they really gotten kind of blurred. And so now kind of everything is on the table both times. So we really, it's you know like going to the doctor and getting a physical twice um, when you think only one should do. Okay, so that's the process. I've forgotten what comes next. There we go. Okay, so when we, I said we put forward an, an ambitious uh, uh, proposal, and for the educational effectiveness review, we promised, uh, I would say Patty promised, I didn't have anything to do with this, uh, Patty promised that we would answer four questions. Uh, how well are our students prepared for the challenges they're going to meet as they go out and become new professionals? Uh, to what extent is there an appropriate level of rigor in our programs? To what extent have we increased and diversified revenue and applied them appropriately to uh, align them with our mission? And how do the indicators of student learning outcomes vary across our programs, across our system, and what are we learning from them about sort of developing a best practices standard from one campus to another? So this is, this is tough. Right? And again, it's not just a matter of saying, yep, nope, maybe. It's a matter of having a lot of information and data behind each of these. So uh, be nice to Patty, because <laughs> she and Alexis and, and others who are on the front lines of our information gathering processes are working really hard on this. this uh, we will again submit a written report about this, which will be due right at the end of the calendar year, late December, early January. And uh, that will be then delivered to the team so they can get ready by the end of March. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Sheila. Well, 
Well, uh, no, it's a good question, and I'll, uh, let me give a partial answer now, and I'll come back to it later. But I would say, well, let's take I merit, for example. I mean, what we have said is that the idea of multicultural competence is absolutely essential to being a qualified professional. So if we believe that, then we ought to be able to back it up. Well, so what the report's going to do, again, because we get to sort of write the exam ourselves, is that we're going to present information through whatever lens that we want to. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll say a minute. I mean, the student services group is actually working on some data that will be a part of our report. But I think our notion is probably going to be to say, through the, through the lens of an academic program, whether it's in psychology or business or law, um, here's what we think it takes to be a competent professional, and here's how we think we're doing it. We draw from all these various moving parts of the university. Now, they may come back and say, we'd like to talk to the iMerit folks because we think that they really don't know what they're doing. In which case, I will give them your home phone number. Um, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to, to a large extent the ability to sort of define the way in which we think these various pieces are relevant to the study questions that we're asking. Okay. Okay. So again, uh, it's not enough just to say, you know, yeah, we're on it. Uh, we really have to demonstrate that we've got processes in place. And even more importantly, that we're making decisions based on what we learn from these self-studies. So if we find out that we've got, I don't know, you know, a retention problem in a particular program. Uh, the students aren't graduating at the rate that we think we, they ought to. It's not enough just to know that. Uh, the question then is, okay, what are you doing about it? Right? And, you know, it may not be the case that we've actually solved the problem, but WASC is going to want to see evidence that we're actually working on it based on data and tracking the progress against the goal. Okay? Now, the way we've chosen to tackle this is um, through kind of two levels of, of review. And again, to Sheila's point, we're kind of focusing on academic programs as the unit of analysis. Um, so last spring, from uh, uh, January to the end of the uh, academic year, every program in the institution submitted a self-study to the provost. All the program directors were responsible for writing up stuff, gathering whatever data they had that showed how they were doing against their own uh, educational objectives, defining those objectives first of all, and then secondly, uh, having, having uh, data about them. The, we're going to do a, a second phase of review, which is going to be an internal peer review of each of these programs, where I think for the first time in the history of Alliant, we're going to have people from one school looking at programs from another school. So we did one uh, around the educational leadership and management programs. Uh, Dr. Ducker was the head of the team that looked at this. And the goal here is to begin to develop a kind of cross-institutional sense of quality so that the faculty from one group have a chance to comment on the others, and hopefully over time we develop some common sense of what our standards are. Uh, we've got two more to do this fall. We're looking at all the PsyD programs across the whole system, and we're looking at uh, our programs in Org Psych. Uh, so again, these are pretty ambitious. Um, you know, I think that we're not going to be perfect in these processes, but I think the fact that we've started them and we're serious about it, and then over time, we will do all the programs in the university in this way. So this will be a cyclical thing, and we'll repeat the cycle as we go through. Um, and then, again, on, on Sheila's uh, point, uh, the student services group is actually gathering data and doing some assessments on some of the support services that we've begun to provide to find out which ones of them are really being effective. So we've had things like writing workshops and dissertation boot camps and career services. Actually, we've had them very uneven. We've sort of had pilot programs on various campuses. We don't really have all these services everywhere. But one of the things we're trying to figure out is which ones make a difference. Um, and so we'll have some better information about that. I want to talk, finish up with sort of what each of our roles and responsibilities are as we prepare for this, because it is going to be a kind of year-long process. 
So, my list of suggestions about how everybody in this room could help. First of all, as for all the reasons I've been harping on, it's really important that people start to understand why we're here. You know, it's not optional. Um, knowing a sense about what this institution is trying to accomplish is really critical. I will tell you that I actually chaired a team um, to Chaminade University, which is a little Catholic college in uh, Honolulu. It's a nice place to have to go do a visit. Um, but one of the things that we wound up being really impressed with, there were about six or seven of us on this team. So Chaminade is an institution that sort of like a lion has gone through a sort of rough time about 10 years ago. It was really on the mend and is doing great stuff. Um, it is a, a, a college that is run by an order of monks called the Marianist Brothers. And one of the things that was incredibly impressive was that they had a statement of their values that came out of this religious tradition. And I don't care whether you agree with the religious tradition or not, what was impressive about it was the degree to which people really, really, really knew about that and could talk about it and say, this is what makes this place special. Uh, it was that set of Marianist values that applied to education. And as a team member, when you're coming in, you kind of parachute in and you want to get an impression of the place as quickly as you can. And like, you know, like a job interview or any other kind of situation, your, your impressions get formed very quickly, right? And then they're hard to shake. And I'll tell you the thing that was just overwhelming, and it was just kind of in the air. I can't even tell you how we picked it up. But I can tell you that every groundskeeper and every faculty member and every administrative assistant knew why they were there because it was around the set of core values. And it was incredibly powerful. So I don't know if we'll get there or not, but I think it's really important that everybody have some familiarity with what makes this place tick. So with that, who wants to tell me the mission? Anybody know where you can find the mission? Portal's an easy answer, right? Well, look, I don't expect everybody to be able to spout it out, and it's not so much the words, I think, but it is a sense of the intent. Alliant prepares students for professional careers of service and leadership. I think that's it right there. I think you can stop and throw away the rest of it. Okay? But I think it's really, really important that that's what we see ourselves doing. That's why we're all working here. Right? Um, now, and it, this is not just some kind of generic thing that every other college and university would have, too. This actually makes us different. This is not the mission statement of a research university. It's also not the mission statement of a four-year liberal arts college or a community college or anybody else. This is a, about what it means to be a professional in today's society. You are a servant leader. You are a person who is providing professional services, but you're also in a very exalted position in our society economically, status, all kinds of ways to be able to call yourself a doctor or a lawyer or a manager gives you a status in society that makes you a leader by definition. And it's that combination of those two things that get married in every one of our programs. I think that's really great. Now the way we manifest that is that we talk about wanting to achieve excellence in four areas. In, 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 in a particular form of education, that again is very focused on getting people out and working in their communities and doing good work. Scholarship, multicultural and international competence, and community engagement. Right? So these things, they actually do kind of cohere. There's a sense to it. And, and I think we, you know, the team last time commented on the fact that we really do seem to be doing this. And I, the other thing I'll say in, in passing, I think we, we really are a leader in developing this kind of mission. There are not many universities in the world that consist entirely of professional schools. Uh, I can think of about two others. So what we're trying to do is pretty unique. And the fact that we can talk about it in these terms is part of that uniqueness. Two, understand the competencies. So some of you are at the faculty, uh, or the, not the faculty, but the convocations at the beginning of the fall, and Russ uh, managed to stump the band on uh, uh, asking the faculty what our competencies are. Again, I don't expect most people to be able to uh, spout these out. Uh, I certainly couldn't. But 
the fact is, what I really would ask you to pay attention to is the fact that we really do have a sense that the, our educational programs are built around a set of things that we expect every Alliant graduate to be able to know and do. Right? We're not just say, you know, sign up for the following 15 courses and you're done and we're going to throw you out the door. We actually expect that those courses will have added up to something and they will produce a person who's got some very defined qualities. Right? They're going to be a person who has that multicultural and international competence. People who are familiar with a body of research and a body of scholarship and how it gets applied to problems in the world. People who have ethics and values appropriate to their profession. Right? And so one of the challenges that we have as an institution is to make sure that our educational programs actually lead to these outcomes. That's the bottom line. So be aware of it. Go any further. There we go. Okay. <laughs> a little bit reflecting again on my experience at Chaminade, the other thing that came through is not only the people knew why they were there, they were extraordinarily proud. And one of the things that I think we undersell ourselves about at Alliant is really understanding how much we have to be proud of. And you know, you can all come up with your own stories, but I'll tell you, I sort of get goosebumps when I think about some of the things that we do around here. They are really, really extraordinary. First of all, we were the first, in all kinds of ways, the first freestanding school of clinical psychology, the first night evening law school in the western United States, um, you know, the first uh, to do the alternative teacher education program that uh, the Huff Settler School does. You know, one of the largest organizational doc uh, psychology doctoral programs in the country. One of the most innovative new forensics programs. In every case, almost all of our programs, if you trace back to why they are exist, it's because we're doing something that other schools either didn't want to do or couldn't do. And so we've got this innovative, sort of cutting edge, pioneering aspect of this university, which is very, very cool. And, you know, we forget about it because it's, a, it's just us, right? It's like your family, you know, what's so special about them? Well, there's a lot that's special about our programs. This was a factoid that I've been preaching about every chance I get because I was stunned. I, for the first time this year, I wrote to Paul Welch, our registrar, and said, so, by the way, where do our students come from? Because I'd never asked the question before. And I was simply flabbergasted to realize that just in the entering class of 2010, the people who just showed up here a couple of weeks ago, these numbers aren't even right. I think it's 36 states and 45 countries. At least one student from every one of those places. I, you know, I was really amazed, right? Um, now think about it. It's not just that we get bragging rights that we've got this kind of reach. Think about the fact that people are coming here from Tunisia and Malaysia and Africa and Germany to come to Little Old Alliant. You know, there's a reason, right? It's because we are doing some stuff that's kind of special and cool, right? We've got some real centers of excellence. I won't claim that all of our programs are, you know, world class, but some of them really are. Some of them really are. Uh, if you look at Psychopharm, if you look at, uh, you know, our MFT programs, you go, Azure. Um, uh, you know, and I don't mean to diminish anybody else, but I think there are some that you just stand out and they say, yeah, everybody knows about us because of that, right? And I think that we've got, uh, and, and some of our research projects are really, really cool. Uh, our diversity statistics, and this is one where I really hope you do sort of be able to recite uh, some of these things. The fifth largest producer of doctorates among Hispanics in the entire United States across all disciplines, from, you know, physics to basket weaving, right? Uh, and within psychology, the number one producer of doctorates among Hispanics and African Americans and Asian Americans and women and all minorities are told. The number nine producer of doctorates in business among African Americans. The number 11 producer of doctorates in business among all minorities. Little old alliance, right? This is really spectacular, powerful stuff. And our community service thing that we've been really working on, we need to do a lot more of. But, you know, this is a statistic that I, about once a month I go to Jen and I say, is this really true? Because I still have a, find it hard to believe and she assures me that it is. 
our students who are out there, our students and our faculty, through their internships and their practica and their student teaching and all the other kind of stuff they're doing in the community, our students are contributing a million hours a year, mostly in the state of California, to public service. Little over the line, you know? It's just staggering the impact of a relatively small institution has in its communities around this state. And so, you know, I truly am proud every day I come to work here. I can say that unequivocally. And I really hope you do, are too, and I hope you show that. Because uh, that's the kind of thing that makes a big difference during the accreditation visit. OK, it must tend to be telling me time's about up. Um, one more. Um, you know, bottom line, this is uh, nothing in particular, but, you know, understand what accreditation is really about. A lot of teams come and get a little bit sidetracked because they find a, an organization that uh, a lot of petty stuff kind of rises to the surface. You know, somebody's unhappy with their, you know, supervisor. They don't like the color of paint on the walls and stuff like that. And unfortunately, that can often color a visit. So I'm not going to tell you you know, there will be public meetings. You'll all have a chance to talk to some of the visitors. I'm not going to tell you what to say. For If you've got things you want to talk about, feel free. There will be a, a private website or a, a, a th thing online where you can submit comments to the team that we'll never see, the administration, and you should use those. But I would ask you to think about why they're here and why we're engaged with this process. And it really is only about one thing. Are we delivering quality programs to our students? with integrity, with a sense of purpose and a sense of mission. That's what it's about. All the other stuff is really just noise. Um, and so I hope that you can be confident in your feelings about that. You know, one thing about this visit is that this is all stuff that we should be doing whether we have to or not. So whether WASC was coming or not, it's a good idea as an organization that we go through this kind of process of self-reflection. And everybody's got a role to play in this because everything we do matters toward that mission. So everybody in here, I know almost everybody here is an administrator, a staff member. You know, you're a part of this as well. It's not just about the faculty and the students. Um, so think about your role uh, associated with all this. So with that, ha, ah, okay, <laughs> the end. <laughs> okay, well, we went longer than I expected, but I've enjoyed it, so I hope you did. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. It's good to see you all. Thanks very much. <laughs>